So hello everyone, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the seven lecture of current topics in the heritage science series uh, of Ypres UNHS Academy. These, um, these series are organized by emerging professionals within the frame of Ypres UNHS project and the Re European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science. My name is Mora Bertaza, I'm heritage scientist at uh, the Historic Royal Palaces and today I'm going to moderate a lecture focused on proteomics uh, in cultural heritage studies. The recording of this lecture will be available later on the IRIS YouTube channel. Furthermore, at the end of the lecture, we'll receive, you will receive a survey. So please take your time to let us know your opinion about the series. And please be aware that the attendance certificate of the lecture will be sent only after the submission of the survey. You can ask questions using the Q&A function and they will be asked to the speaker at the end of the lecture. In case you will experience any technical issue, please uh, use the chat and let us know. Our speaker today is uh, Caroline Solazzo. She is a proteomic scientist specialized in the study of ancient protein products in material culture, in particular keratin-based tissues. She's obtained her PhD in analytical chemistry for, from the University of uh, Lille in France in collaboration with the Smithsonian Institution, where she worked on early development of proteomics techniques for the study of ancient proteins, in particular animal fibers. She conducts postdoctoral research studies at uh, BioArc at the University of York and egg research in New Zealand, thanks to a Marie Curie International Fellowship where she conduct research on wool for application of, to ancient textiles. In 2012, she returned back to Smithsonian Institution as a part of the new proteomics and biomolecular mass spectrometry laboratory team. She is specialized in the study of ancient protein products in material culture and in particular on keratin-based tissues. Today, she will present a literature uh, lecture title Proteomics in Cultural Heritage Field, the case of fibrous proteins. Dr. Solazzo, thank you for being here today and please, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much for the introduction and um, I will share my screen now. Um, and thank you for inviting me to share some of my... Sorry, I have to share again. Good working now and yeah so thank you for inviting me to share some of my research on proteomics uh, which have been involved in this field almost since the beginning um, it's, it's been a, a applied to cultural heritage so let's uh, jump into it so what's proteomics so proteomics is a study of a complete sets of proteins which are expressed with a system and we call it uh, the proteome <clears throat> Proteins are derived from DNA for the, via, via messenger RNA uh, and through a process uh, that translates genetic code into the building blocks uh, uh, that are the amino acids that make up the proteins. Proteins are also subjected to many types of modifications uh, after their biosynthesis <clears throat> that are called post-translational modifications and uh, affect their structure and functions. So in a nutshell, prote proteomics provides tools to identify and quantify proteins in a substrate, characterize their different uh, modification, and understand how they function and interact with uh, each other. So compared to modern proteomics, uh, working with ancient protein, proteins are as different goals and uh, a whole range of uh, challenges especially uh, associated with um, uh, studying proteins that are sometimes very old and very degraded. But it has nevertheless been quite successful uh, with an increasing number of applications. So some of these applications are uh, uh, specific identification by, uh, for, for so archaeological uh, applications, so, um, uh, and uh, to identify materials such as, uh, species in materials such as bones, uh, leather, hair, and so on. It's used to study ancient diets, uh, microbiomes, tissues, uh, especially in tissues that are very rich in information, like food residues or tentor calculus. It has great applications in evolutionary studies uh, by studying changes in proteins over a long period of time. 
And in cultural heritage, proteomics has been used uh, to study all types of uh, protein binders, adhesive, lacquer, lacquers, uh, et cetera, in artworks. And finally, proteomics can be a useful tool for conservation science in museums, not only to uh, characterize the composition of objects, but also to uh, study the degradation of materials, um, the damage done by bioorganisms, and the consequences of conservation treatments. There are many tools in proteomics, but the uh, most common approach is uh, called bottom-up proteomics, which uh, is the analysis of proteins after they have been uh, cut into smaller uh, fragments called peptides, as opposed to uh, top-down proteomics, which analyzes intact proteins. So I'll describe the three steps of the workflow, and then we illustrate with an uh, example from uh, working with fibrous proteins at what, what we can learn uh, with proteomics. So the first step is the sample preparation. And uh, so to summarize, proteins are these long chains of amino acids, of which there are uh, 20 different types. The amino acids are made with an amino group, a carboxy group, and a side chain, uh, which is variable, um, and which I will present it here for each amino acid. A protein sequence will be written in this way with each letter corresponding to, a, to, a, to an amino acid. So for example, C corresponds to the cysteine, which is an amino acid with a side a sure, uh, as a side group, uh, which is a sulfur uh, group. So the typical steps of sample preparations are the extractions of proteins from the substrate followed by uh, usually by reduction activation. So we start by solubilizing the proteins in these uh, different types of buffers. Um, from many proteins, because they have cysteines, uh, they form T-sulfid bridges with other cysteines, and so this needs to be broken to properly unfold the proteins. So we, so this is a step of reduction and uh, activation to, um, to replace uh, so the group and uh, prevent the oxidation. Then there is a cleanup step to remove salt and contaminants, followed by the enzymatic digestion to produce uh, peptides. The most used enzyme is trypsin that cuts specifically after uh, lysine, or the K, or uh, arginine, which is in R. And these are very common um, amino acids, fancy proteins. Then we have a final cleanup, and we can use a mass spectrometry analysis. So the protein sequence, once it's cut uh, by trypsin, produces this kind of, of, of peptides. Uh, so there are smaller fragments that can be uh, amenable for mass spectrometry. These peptides are first analyzed uh, in MS uh, by the mass to charge uh, in MS1 mode. And uh, each peptide can then be first fragmented uh, into its amino acid sequence. So a typical mass spectrum uh, obtained in MS1 mode is, uh, for example, this one, which uh, was obtained with a small bit of MS. So here's the whole uh, peptide mixture is deposited on the plate and mixed with a matrix. And uh, it's uh, then uh, analyzed by mass spectrometry with small detail. So on this uh, spectrum, which is an effective mass interpret, uh, representing sheep wool, modern sheep wool, we have all this, uh, each peak corresponds to a peptide of the keratin sequences. And in red, I have highlighted some markers that are very useful to identify a uh, sheep, including this one, uh, marker 9, which corresponds to this sequence and is unique to, uh, to sheep wool. In archaeological samples, uh, uh, such as this one we have here, which is a textile from Mongolia, uh, very highly mineralized. Um, you can see that the profile is much more degraded. We have a lot uh, of background noise and smaller peaks, which correspond to the proteins of red Some of the peaks are will be missing. Uh, some of the markers uh, will be missing, especially the one at higher uh, master chart. You can still see the, the ship marker, which is very, uh, very tiny at the low intensity here, which indicates that we have a ship here. So PMF is a good and fast technique to identify simple substrates uh, when you have one type of protein, and it is used a lot for specific identification. For complex mixture, and if we want some sequence information, we need to turn to FCMSMS. So in this case, the peptide, peptide mixture is first separated by a liquid chromatography, 
without being sent to the mask uh, analyzer. So here's a chromatic one for at each given retention time, you have uh, some MS scan, and each uh, selected ions can be perfect fragmented to have the MS MS spectrum. And we end up with a list of um, all the MS MS uh, spectra that are sent into a search engine for database like such. So, an example here of a uh, protein identified, uh, it's a small protein, is each fragment in blue corresponding to a, a peptide that was matched. Uh, from the database. And then an example of MS and spectra being a uh, match where uh, basically each thing can be associated with uh, an amino acid. Mm -hmm. So, database search uh, has some limits because we can only identify uh, proteins, uh, match them to what's in the database. And uh, fortunately, there are still uh, many data spaces that have not been sequenced. So that uh, tools that we can use to um, to assist database database search is uh, called the novel sequencing, which is uh, basically obtaining new new sequence peptide sequencing sequence, sequences by reading the sigma uh, spectrum. So kind of manually. So first type of uh, fibrous proteins I will present are the one uh, that are found in wool. So wool fibers are formed by uh, the particles, the external layer, and uh, the cortex. Cortex are packed with microfibrils, um, uh, which are then packed with intermediate filaments. The basic unit, unit uh, of intermediate filaments uh, are, uh, are the keratins, uh, and they are also called keratin uh, intermediate filament proteins. The keratins are right-handed, uh, alpha, uh, alpha right-handed, Alpha structure and so come in two types. So type one, acidic, and so type two, baby. Um, a dimer of uh, keratin is formed by what? one type one and right, one type two proteins. So it's then from petromeres and then protofibrils and are then packed in intermediate filaments. And so intermediate filaments are surrounded by a, a, mat a matrix which is made by keratin associated proteins, which are uh, shorter proteins, such as keratins, and usually are rich in uh, certain amino acids, such as cysteine, so very high in medicine, high in sulfur. And uh, cysteine uh, in the caps from uh, super produced with uh, intermediate filament, which provides uh, high resistance to, uh, to physical and chemical damage. So what does it look like when we work with archaeological textiles? Uh, on this here, we have an example of a textile from uh, Mongolia, which was found in a, in a burial in northern Mongolia, so called environment. And uh, on this uh, side, we have uh, cells that were found from a burial in Germany and had the characteristic uh, to be from the waterlogged side. So the fibers could be seen under wet conditions, but once it dries, it, it, it gets this very brittle mass where fibers cannot be um, identified. So a standard protocol for wool uh, is extraction overnight with a buffer, urea, or bonding, uh, reduction activation because of uh, wool is rich in its sustains, is um, reduced. Dialysis and some trips in digestion overnight. Um, in modern wool, we can recover uh, up to 90% of the proteins. So uh, that means that 90% of the type 1 or type 2 keratins can be uh, identified. In archaeological samples, we usually get uh, less, but here we have in the uh, Mongolian sample, we have up to 70%, which is really good. And in some sample from Germany, uh, there's a hand we see that there are very low identification with very about 30% of the protein that's identified. So, the so consequence of this is that uh, in the sample from Mongolia, we can identify the sample is a bit cheap, but not in the one from Germany. So, since normal extraction to then work uh, on citrosine and fibers are uh, due to the fiber being basically stuck in the matrix. Uh, a new strategy was uh, adopted by uh, basically skipping the extraction step and doing uh, a short reduction activation step at high temperature for only 10 minutes. And uh, it really improves the results. So, what we have here are the 
I think the some page coverage of Sakara teams identified in the uh, trusting them samples and here compared to modern one. Uh, so the bad fraction is the one that uh, after activation, addition activation, uh, so the bad fraction, and then we have the what's room and the matrix, and then we have the total fraction when the fractions are not separated. And direct digestion is when we do a direct digestion with fixing on the matrix without any kind of treatment before. So direct digestion doesn't work. Doesn't work very well on modern wood either because we have uh, also the systems. But what we uh, see with uh, this treatment at high temperature, that's uh, the protein to then get into the soluble fraction, but they uh, remain in the insoluble fraction and we're somehow made more accessible for treating. And we really improve the, um, the identification. So the type markers that could not be identified before uh, were now uh, identified. Um, and in particular, uh, cis peptide, which is a uh, shape marker. So the next study will illustrate mutations we can face when we have incomplete database, uh, when we work with unusual uh, types of fibers. So this project is about identifying uh, Fiscacha hair in pre-colonial textiles. So Fiscacha is this little uh, animal which looks a little bit like a rabbit and it lives in uh, South America. It's been represented on pre-colonial text uh, tapestry, uh, colonial, colonial tapestry uh, from the Andes uh, from the 16th, 18th century. And it's also be uh, mentioned by early chroniclers uh, for uh, its soft tool that was supposedly used to make clothes for the nobility. So here we can see the sketch out with a, a noble woman. Um, it's never really been identified in textiles until now, but uh, I was asked um, to identify this sketch by Elena Phipps, who identified, could recognize the fiber in certain textiles, or could recognize that there was something unusual with these fibers, like the one you see here. So it's um, very long, very soft. Uh, and uh, some kind of brownish color, uh, quite different from the rest. Um, so um, we looked at uh, seven objects, two that came back with uh, a candidate identification, and five in which we got uh, something like that, which is uh, chinchilla identification. So all the keratins are matching uh, chinchilla. So luckily for us, chinchilla is a closest relative to, uh, to Fiscaccia. So basically in the chinchilla family, there are three genera. The chinchilla, the mountain uh, Fiscaccia, which is from, from the Lagillon uh, genus. So the mountain Fiscaccia lives in the Andes uh, of Bolivia, Peru, Argentina, and Chile. And the cell uh, genus is uh, Lacostomos, which is the plant Fiscaccia, uh, which lives in Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay. So the question was, uh, can we tell them apart with proteomics? So I got a specimen, uh, hair from specimen on, on uh, each of these uh, species. And um, since uh, the chinchilla has been uh, pretty sequenced, we have uh, the, the basic uh, proteins to start with. So here is a, a keratin from chinchilla. In red are markers that are specific to chinchilla. And with uh, the novel sequencing, we can obtain new peptide sequences. So like this one in green, which is uh, specific to mountain Piscacha, with a light Lagigion uh, genus. It has the particularity of having, instead of a strain in here, it's to do deep aerialism. And for the Lacostomus, uh, we get, uh, for example, this peptide with three substitution compared to the chinchilla sequence and is also specific to Lacostomus. So when we do that a few more times, we get a list of peptides. Uh, some of them are specific to Lagigium, some of them to Chinchilla, some of them to Lacostomus, and some are specific, uh, common to, um, to, to, uh, to species. And each sample we analyzed, um, which where we identified Chinchilla, uh, Chinchilla species uh, came back with a Lagigium match. So all the uh, identified as mountain fiscation. The second category of fibrous proteins are the silk fibrins. 
So domestic silk comes from silkworm or mixed mori, which is made of high, highly crystalline and insoluble proteins, fibrins, which are glued uh, with sericin, which is a protein that is usually removed by the degumin during processing of silk. The main proteins of pombix mori, mori come in two forms, so light chain, uh, which is a short amorphous protein, and a so heavy chain uh, fibrin, which is a long protein of uh, over 5,000 residues with many repetitive fragments. So high crystallity of high, high chain is due to amino acid with short side chain, like lysine, alanine, and serine, which forms this uh, tight, tight packing. And they forms this repeat pattern, such as this one. Silk is insoluble in water, but can be dissolved in concentrated organic salt solution, uh, such uh, as an aqu aqueous calcium chloride ethanol solution. solution. So heavy chain has very few arginine and lysine, so it can't be digested with trypsin. So we usually, uh, so the best enzyme to use for, um, for silk is a chemotrypsin, with, which cut after amino acids such as tyrosine, which are quite common in, uh, in silk. And then there are also so wild silks, uh, which is, uh, have been used in archaeological textiles as well. And they are quite different from Bombix Mori. First, there is no uh, light chain, and they have different patterns, such as uh, poly polyalanine sequences with uh, four or more alanine residues. They do not solubilize in the solution most used uh, for Bombix Mori. And uh, I will refer you to this article by Bo Yong Li, who did uh, who figured how figured out how to solubilize white silk and uh, how to identify them by proteomics. Um, so she used a solution of a calcium nitrate here and she identified um, white silk in, in archaeological textiles from Pandora. So another fiber that's often referred as sea silk has in fact nothing to do with silk uh, from silk worms. Um, sea silk uh, comes from the basis of the Pina nobilis uh, species in the pen shell family. So by this are these silk-like threads used by the shell to attach itself to the sea floor. So have been used to make small articles of clothing or accessories like this cloth. Sea silk has been made into textiles in the Greek and Roman periods, but the production was very limited as it was difficult uh, to procure the, the raw material uh, and it's quite labor intensive as well. So objects were made with uh, biases are quite rare nowadays, and uh, which is also quite, might be due to the fragility, the high degradation of the fibers. So knowing what it's made of, it, uh, it's important. Protein makeup of no, uh, Pina nobilis is not known, and uh, there are very few proteins in database uh, for this space, particular species. We know it's different from the closest uh, organisms that has been uh, studied, which are the blue mussels from the um, Mytilidae family. Uh, the basis from Mytilus uh, is made of collagenous polymers, but we know it's not the case for Pinanopolis. So when we uh, analyzed the raw fibers and the yarn, uh, we obtained, uh, the matches we obtained were not collagen, but were for uh, a few proteins, uh, such as food protein and a glycoprotein from uh, species uh, such as this one, so uh, cro relatively close species to a pinot So these species this species don't have, uh, are not well sequenced, so there is a, a lack of sequences to improve uh, our protein matches. We still could obtain uh, uh, a lot of new peptide sequences through de novo um, sequencing, which allows to increase the identification of the proteins. And uh, in red, you can see the pe peptides that we have found for the, um, from, the uh, from the raw fiber and in blue, the one from the uh, yarn. And it shows a lot of diversity, which is uh, with multiple markers for, um, for each peptide. So potentially, Museum objects made of biases could be quite important to study the species, uh, which is uh, and the diversity of the species, which is highly endangered. <clears throat> Finally, I will finish with the uh, uh, last type of pro pro uh, fibrous proteins, which are the collagen, and are found in uh, so many types of objects. Uh, so, collagen is found in the skin, uh, which is then made in uh, objects such as leather and parchment. 
Um, we also find uh, collagen in, uh, in animal guts, intestines, which are also made into objects, and uh, in all type of uh, bone glue, glue, high glue, or fish glue uh, that are used at, as adhesives. So collagen fibrils are made uh, from three polypeptide chains, which are twisted together to form a right-handed triple helix. The most abundant collagen in skin is type 1 collagen, which is made of a triple helix of two alpha 1 chains and one alpha 2 chains. And also uh, we have collagen type 3. Collagen has a very repetitive pattern with abundant proline and atroxyproline and uh, one amino acid glycine, which occurs every, every three um, uh, residues. So one project when we can encounter all these kind of materials is um, ones that I'm uh, working on, which are metal threads uh, found in textiles. And these uh, metal threads are very particular because they are made uh, with an organic substrate. So the gold or the killed silver is uh, uh, glued on, on, uh, on the organic substrate, which, which can be either a membrane, so uh, from intestine or just uh, guts or this kind of membranes, um, and were uh, found made in Europe. Uh, especially between the 11, 15, 11 and 15th century. Uh, we have um, metal sweat, which are made with skin, uh, so usually leather, um, and we are more broadly used, so we can find them from Europe to East Asia, and um, they were made for longer periods of time as well. Um, so with proteomics, we can identify uh, the species of the substrate, so either the membrane or the skin, but we can also look for adhesives and identify uh, the adhesive if it's made from proteins. So membrane threads are, uh, I'm showing you an example here, it's a very thin membrane. Uh, this one has killed silver, so it's quite tarnished. Um, we looked at membranes from uh, uh, many objects, over 20 objects from the 20, uh, from the 12th to the 15th, 16th century. All of them were made with a, a bovine membrane. They are, the proteome of the membrane is quite uh, complex compared to skin. It has uh, many types of, of collagen proteins, which are found, uh, shown here in red. In green, you also have the smooth muscle proteins, which are quite important, uh, such as actin, desmin, myosin, and, and quite uh, uh, specific to the membrane, and we have also other types of proteins such as actin binding, uh, blood protein enzymes. There. For skin metal, uh, metal threads, um, so the protein makeup is, is a bit easier, uh, simpler. We only have the collagen type 1 and type 3 mostly. Uh, here, the so skin threads are much thicker. We can uh, usually make up the uh, adhesive uh, layer between the gold and the, the skin. On this example here from Spain, we have a uh, laser which is made from uh, gold with an adhesive uh, made with egg white, which is identified by the uh, On these uh, textiles from Italy or the Middle East, we have um, a laser which is made from sheep and an adhesive made of fish glue from the sturgeon family. And finally, I will finish uh, with another example of uh, laser identification in corsets from the daughters of the American Revolution Museums. Uh, so, so laser is used to bond uh, the corset. You can see it, it here. And what's really interesting with this uh, project is that uh, the corsets are donated to the museum. So we have, um, they come with a mystery, some provenance information, dates, and sometimes uh, a narrative of uh, how the object was made. And um, so for example, this one, uh, we know that it says from the donor, it says that the stays are born with palm tanned deer skin. And on this one, we have uh, interesting stories that say that the, Grandfather shot a rabbit and times the height for the dangling. So it's interesting because we can uh, 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 do proteomics analysis and uh, see if these informations are correct. 
So on these two corsets, uh, including the one that was uh, supposedly born to his uh, deer skin, uh, so the species identified uh, actually was sheep. So uh, no doubt about it. Uh, we have here a peptide marker for sheep. Uh, so no deer at all. In the corset from the right, we, uh, we found something quite unusual, which was uh, the corset was matched with a marmot, a species from the marmota family. Uh, so uh, marmota marmota is a uh, marmot from uh, Europe. And if we uh, look at other type of rodents, uh, we really have a best match for marmot. Um, so two, uh, two species that could be a match in the US is uh, marmota flavial centuries, which is in the Western coast. But the most likely match would be uh, the woodchuck or corn hog, which lives in the, in the east coast of, uh, of the US. So quite an unusual find here, and they didn't uh, match at all the ideas that was supposed to believe to be, uh, to be made and to really have been used. And finally, the one where uh, rabbit was supposed to have been used for the hide uh, also gave us some uh, very um, unexpected results because it actually came back as a cat. So, we really unexpected um, the other type of um, wildcats that could be found in the US are puma and lynx, but we have here two peptides that are specific to the phalis genus and uh, are not present in puma or lynx. So there's also very little doubt about the identification here uh, as, a, as a cat. So just, uh, this is to finish my talk and uh, show you that the pattern will spend some time uh, Give some very unexpected and surprising results. Thank you so much, Caroline. It was a very interesting uh, presentation, really. Um, I didn't expect so many species of animal that you can we can find in our object, in an artistic object. Thank you. But before going through to all the question that I'm sure will come. I would like to invite all of you to the next lecture on the 20th of April, where uh, Dr. Daniel Olfin will talk about the X-ray imaging in cultural heritage. As usual, the lecture will be at 3 p.m. Rome time.